there are other additional rules about how far back Social Security can pay you in terms of back pay. And it varies between Title II disability insurance claims versus Title 16 supplemental security income claims. There's a lot of factors at play. Uh, so it's important that, you know, before filing an appeal, you first just understand like, well, what's even at stake? Is there any money on the table that I am uh, uh, potentially, I could potentially win with a successful appeal? It's important to ask that question because on the other side, there is a risk. Welcome to the Evans Disability Podcast. We hope to be your definitive guide through the Social Security Administration landscape. I'm Peter Evans, your host and managing partner at Evans Disability, a law firm that handles disability cases throughout the United States. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to mention a special resource for our listeners. Click the link below to receive a free SSA disability guide from Evans Disability. This guide is packed with details on SSA disability programs, expert tips for winning your case, and sample questions from actual disability hearings. Join me as I sit down with special guests, including experienced lawyers, our extremely well-trained staff, and even a former Social Security Law judge. If you find our content useful, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to stay updated on our latest discussions. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Good morning, Mervin. How are you? Good morning, Mr. Evans. I'm doing all right. How are you? Uh, I am uh, fighting a cold, and uh, but still, still pushing forward because I really wanted to have a conversation with you today about today's topic, which I think is going to be interesting for a lot of folks. Um, for those of uh, our listeners who don't know you, your name is Mervin Kurniawan. Uh, you are uh, considered a, a certified non-attorney representative. Uh, and um, and I'm going to link your uh, bio interview in the description. Um, but you can basically practice law within the Social Security Administration. And you've uh, taken an exam uh, that was given to you by Social Security. You passed that exam. Uh, and, uh, and now you're uh, allowed to represent folks uh, only within the Social Security Administration, not you know, obviously practicing other areas of law. Um, you have been with our firm, gosh, uh, I want to say past six years or five years. I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. Started it's right the, around the five-year mark at this point. Yeah. yeah, you've done numerous hearings and you've done it, done everything in the firm in a lot of ways. Um, uh, you know, helping people apply and appeal and, um, you know, and uh, one of the things that I like to tell folks uh, and refer to you internally as well as our ambassador of hope and encouragement as our mission is to uh, to bring hope, encouragement, and knowledge uh, to our clients um, by helping them walk through the Social Security Disability Administration. Um, so, uh, but for those of uh, that are listeners that want to get to know you better, I will go ahead and link your bio uh, and they can listen to it. Um, I, I, just as a quick explanation, I think of it as a what a nurse practitioner is to it and versus what a doctor is. And a lot of times when you go into a medical visit, you'll be seen by a nurse practitioner and not even know because uh, so seamlessly they can do many of the same things. Yeah, so I think that's a very fit analogy. In today's topic, one of the things that we get asked quite a bit and then I wanted to talk to you about are kind of what are a claimant's options uh, after they win their their case, and then uh, and then also, what are the claimant's options after you know getting an unfavorable? And perhaps we talk about it at each level um, at recon hearing the appeals council. And uh, so I'm going to start with you, and then just put that out there. Why don't we talk about if a person who applies and they win at application, what sort of can they expect? What are some of their options? Uh, moving forward uh, and go from there. Yeah, yeah. So what's important is remembering that there are different types of disability programs within Social Security. Uh, and and this really comes into play once you receive notification that you've been found medically disabled. The process for determining medical uh, uh, 
disability within Social Security. It's the same whether you're applying for disability insurance benefits, often called SSDI or DIB, or if you're applying for supplemental security income, uh, shortened to SSI. Those are the two most common programs that people apply for, and uh, and they will both have the same process for the medical uh, disability determination. But once that determination is made, if you are applying for SSDI, in my experience, you will soon get your notice of award and you can expect your payments uh, uh, to happen uh, fairly quickly after that. But if you are applying for supplemental security income, there is another level. And this is true whether you win at the application level or somewhere else in the claims process. Social Security will get in touch with you and do something called a pre-effectuation review conference or contact or PERC for short, P-E-R-C. They will contact you either, uh, uh, sometimes they start the contact in writing, other times it'll be a phone call, it really kind of depends on the agent's style. Uh, and then they will need to review essentially your financial information, your financial uh, eligibility for SSI keeping in mind that there is that very strict and, in my opinion, far too low uh, resource limit for $2,000 if you are a single individual, $3,000 in combined resources if you are married and live with your spouse, uh, with some exceptions, like the vehicle exemption, property, you're allowed to own property as long as you're living on it. Um, but aside from that, pretty much anything that is either cash or can be turned into cash is counted as a resource. And after you're found medically disabled for SSI, an agent will review all of that uh, information uh, to determine both your ongoing eligibility and your potential past due eligibility, your back pay, uh, during the period of time that you were found disabled, had been applying for SSI, um, and uh, now they need to check to make sure your resources during that entire period were below the limit. So that's a, a, a thing that will happen um, after your your your. Uh, medically favorable decision for SSI is made. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question, uh, uh, Mr. Evans, about that. Uh, and then I also want to talk about uh, in terms of options, because there, there is kind of two ways you can win, the fully favorable and the partially favorable, and that can happen at the application level. It's not just something that happens at hearing. So then there's options to talk about. Um, most people who get a fully favorable decision, they're going to want to accept it. But when it's a partially favorable decision, now you have to have a, a ideally a discussion with your legal representative about well what are my options and what am i risking or what's at stake if i pursue an appeal yeah let's talk about that so they get the medical determination on a title two dib case and it's really important that they read that determination closely because in that letter it will list a date um, of when you became disabled and I think when you when a claimant applies for Social Security, they put in a date called the alleged onset date. This is like I'm alleging I became disabled on, you know, March second of two thousand and nineteen. Okay, so let's say that's the alleged onset date. But Social Security will send you that medical determination. You need to see what date they decided that you became medically disabled. And why don't you talk about that? Because, and really what the difference is between what we call a fully favorable and a partially favorable. Yeah, yeah. So very good point. Uh, in the application, you have to set a date for when you're alleging your disability started. Uh, and then when you get the letter saying you've been found medically disabled, which sometimes doesn't come, sometimes it's just a notice of award and you don't get a separate letter. Again, it seems to vary between agents and offices, whether you'll get a, um, the first letter saying you've been found medically disabled and now we're making a determination on the non-medical side of your claim. But if it's important to read these letters carefully or have someone you've hired to read these letters carefully because it's not in big, bold letters, uh, oftentimes, that uh, Social Security has found you disabled, but they they found you disabled as of a different date than what you alleged on the application. Uh, when a judge writes a decision like that, then it is in bold. At the very top, it'll say partially favorable, or it'll say fully favorable. Uh, but when it's a, a decision at the application or the reconsideration levels, 
Uh, it's it's subtle. It's easy to miss if you don't know to look for it. Uh, that's why you have to look at the date that they are saying your disability started because it can have dramatic impacts on your, especially on your past due benefits, potentially on your ongoing benefits for um, uh, for SSDI, for Title II Disability Insurance Benefits, because if they just found you disabled last month, your disability started last month, you can't expect payments for the first five full months of the onset of your disability. That's one of the fine prints of SSDI uh, that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. I certainly was not aware of it until I started this job and you had to explain to me about the five full month rule and to make sure that people are aware so it's not a, a, an unpleasant surprise um, that uh, uh, your disability benefits, the first five full months of your of your um, disability, there are no payments either if, if it's ongoing or past due. Um, so that's why you want to look at the letter stating from Social Security, if you've gotten one saying that you've been found medically disabled, well, what's the... A, what's the established onset date? And is it the same as what I alleged on my application? Otherwise, I have to make the consideration of do I want to appeal or do I want to accept the decision from Social Security? Right. So basically, a fully favorable would be that they agree with that date you alleged in your application. Social Security agrees that you became disabled on that date. Yeah. What we're calling a partially favorable is that they don't agree with the date you became disabled, but they do agree that you are disabled. Yeah. So the discrepancy is when did your disability begin? Yeah. Yeah. And I think potentially, although I've never seen this happen, they could also say your disability ended at some point in a partially favorable decision. They could say, well, we agree that you had a, a period of disability lasting at least one year so that you can get benefits. But we believe that at some point you either demonstrated by working that you got better or the medical records show that you got better or both. Um, so your period of disability ended. And this is still a partially favorable decision because it it doesn't uh, entirely agree with what you are saying is the status of your disability. Yeah, but at a, so agree at a hearing level, they call it a closed period of disability. And I think they might technically call it a closed period of disability within Social Security as long as that closed period was 12 months or more, you can get kind of a one lump sum payment depending on the program, but yeah. basically get your bad pay for that year. Why don't you tell the, the listeners, what are the options for a claimant if they do get a partially favorable, uh, what are the options? Uh, you know, like appeal rights and whatnot. And then what are some of the you know, warnings or, or or not warnings, but things that they have to be uh, cautious of or cognizant of uh, if they do decide to appeal. Yeah, yeah, very good question. So, um, in all of these letters from Social Security, there should be a section about uh, your rights to uh, an appeal. It's usually in a section said uh, if you disagree with our decision. Uh, this is most often important when you're dealing with a partially favorable decision or a denial of benefits. Usually, if it's a fully favorable, there's really no reason to uh, uh, disagree with their decision unless there's something, a mistake that you notice that they made. Um, uh, but with a partially favorable decision, and this is why I, I strongly encourage uh, having the discussion with an appointed representative, someone who can analyze your case, um, you can say that, no, I, I disagree. I, I believe that my disability started on the date that I put on the application. It didn't start when you said it It did, Social Security. So I want to pursue uh, my case further for the potential for additional back pay. I, I say potential for additional back pay because this is why I think uh, uh, talking to a, a, a law firm that specializes in this is important. There are other additional rules about how far back Social Security can pay you in terms of back pay. And it varies between Title II disability insurance claims versus Title 16 supplemental security income claims. There's a lot of factors at play. Uh, so it's important that, you know, before filing an appeal, you first just understand like, well, what's even at stake? Is there any money on the table that I am uh, uh, potentially... I could potentially win with a successful appeal. It's important to ask that question because on the other side, there is a risk 
um, uh, that you may lose what you have already been awarded by Social Security. In that, in that section about uh, your appeal rights, if you disagree with the decision, it'll tell you what type of appeal uh, to file. Uh, whether if this decision came at the initial level, you can file a request for reconsideration. Um, if it's a decision at reconsideration, you can file a request for hearing and have your case heard by a judge. But regardless of that, the next decision maker in your case is not beholden to the previous decision. And that's good and bad. It means they can find you a fully favorable decision saying, oh, yeah, you're right, Mr. Smith, Ms. Smith. You have been disabled since the date that you put on the application, but they can also say something very adverse to you and say, I don't think your disability uh, uh, started then. I, in fact, don't think you have a disability at all. Uh, so if my decision becomes final, you don't have a disability, sir or ma'am, uh, and your benefits will be, um, uh, your ongoing benefits will stop. Uh, your you will have to pay back uh, the benefits that uh, Social Security has already awarded and, and paid you. Uh, so there is that risk reward uh, that comes with appealing a partially favorable decision. And I think I briefly mentioned it uh, just uh, uh, in passing, but one of the benefits is you can get your ongoing benefits as you appeal a partially favorable. But if you lose and, that, and the Social Security's final uh, decision is that you're not disabled, all of that has to be paid back. Uh, you will be issued an overpayment. Yeah. Um, but you can fight the overpayment as well. Yeah, you can. So you can try to not have to pay it back by um, uh, proving elements uh, that, A, there's two big real questions, and I don't want to deep dive into overpayment cases, but basically proving that the overpayment is not your fault, which it wasn't. You didn't you know, going through an appeal process is your legal right and it's not your fault. Meaning like you didn't do anything unscrupulous, like work under the table or do anything like that. Social Security knew you were going through it through the appeal process. And then if you can prove that uh, you can't afford to pay pay it back, um, mm -hmm. meaning, and that's that, that in and of itself can be the fight, right? Like I don't have any money and then, but you're sitting on all this back pay maybe, you know? Um, so it just kind of depends, but I don't, Let's not deep dive into overpayments. But um, one of the questions I wanted to kind of ask you is, and we did a, a podcast um, with Haley about how to navigate the notice of award. And she talks about how far back you can get paid. And that you bring up a great link. And the question is, is if you do disagree with Social Security and how they um, the date they found you disabled, what is it that you're actually fighting for regarding your back pay? Because that's really what you're fighting for is more back pay because you're going to get your ongoing month to month benefits. So then you're saying, Hey, look, I'm giving up this back pay if I don't appeal. And in making that determination, what is it just generally, and we, I'll link the Navigating Notice of Award uh, in the description, but what is it that you look at when you're having these conversations with people? Like, A, how far can a dip case actually be paid back? Because I gave an example of, you know, March something of 2018. But if they find me disabled of March something of 2020, you know, and I'm like, ah, as a client, I really want 2018. Um, you know, what? what would you say then? And also, how far back can they pay in an SSI case? Yeah, yeah. So with... with uh...